Welcome everyone. This is our EBC, our Evidence-Based Coaching Thought Leaders webinar, and it is June 5th, 2019. I'm excited today to have Dr. Millie Mokadeen. She's an alum of Fielding and a, an executive coach uh, from the PhD program, and she's going to be presenting her research today on understanding the role of metacognition in executive coaching. And I'm sure she'll under, give us some understanding of what metacognition is <laughs> for those of us that may not be quite aware of that term. Um, and just to introduce uh, Dr. Mocha Dean, uh, she's a senior organizational effectiveness leader with over 20 years of experience in executive coaching and organizational effectiveness. Uh, Millie has partnered with clients across the US, Canada, Europe, Middle East, and Africa in a variety of roles spanning organizational effectiveness organizational design, primary and secondary research, strategy, talent management, and large-scale organizational change. Uh, she has a, garnered an impressive record of accomplishments in both scholarship and practice, and her uncanny ability as a synthesizer between knowledge and practice comes from lifelong scholarship and in-depth practical experience. As a keen researcher with a PhD in human and organizational systems, and human development. Her work has been published in several organizational development books as well as the International Journal of Knowledge Sciences. So welcome Dr. Mekadeen and we're Thank thrilled you. to have you. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my uh, video and mute myself and uh, turn it over to you to share your research and then we'll be asking some questions and having dialogue at the end of your presentation. So welcome. Thank you. I'm really honored to be part of the conversation today on um, um, this EBC Thought Leaders program. So I want to, without further ado, I'm going to actually pull up my screen here so that I can share the information that I've um, put together for you. Bear with me just one second. Okay. So um, I embarked on my research to look at what the role of metacognition is in executive coaching. And I'm gonna go into just a little bit of detail of, of uh, what metacognition actually means and give you a rough overview of what my study looked like, what it involved, who was part of it, and what the results were. So I'll jump right in and start off by saying that one of the key competences required in effective coaching as we all know, is facilitating learning and results. Um, the, what keeping in mind as we go along the webinar is that learning doesn't manifest suddenly, it actually builds and it's shaped by what we really know. So we're going, the definition that we're going to use for learning as we go through this is, it's the act of acquiring new information or modifying, reinforcing existing knowledge, behavior, skills, values, preferences, and it also may involve a little bit of integrating the information together. So that being said, if we assume, um, or rather, um, like, like, I've, like I said, one of the goals of executive coaching is some behavior change on the part of the executive and the other is learning. So if we assume that everyone has a predisposition to learning in a particular way, then that means that cognitive awareness of a coach's learning strategy preference will actually impact how the coach interacts with their clients. So um, what, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that um, over the past four decades or so, there's been numerous research studies on learning styles, relationship between learners' preferences, instruction delivery modes, and much of this research seems to have been based in educational settings but there really hasn't been substantial research using learning styles and learning strategy preferences in, the, in what we refer to as the non-academic sector. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was to take a look at, because again, there's learning involved, we're looking at adults, we're assuming that if you're going through executive coaching, you are an adult. And so it makes sense that we explore um, coaching through, I guess you could say a learning lens, and so that's what I sort of jumped on to take a look and see if I could um, keep my study aim, which was to contribute empirical value to the discipline of coaching. So I thought, yes, an exploration of coaching through the lens of learning and learning strategies might uncover 
a theoretical explore, exploration that could maybe contribute to advancing the realm of coaching from a field of practice to a field of study. And so one of the things that I knew I could actually examine was what impact cognitive awareness training had on what professionals do. So if you think of cognitive awareness training, I'm sure most of you have done assessments, things that cognitively make you aware of who you are as a person, or sometimes make you aware of why people do what they do as people. And so that's what I mean when I talk about cognitive um, awareness um, training, if you can call it that, or learning. So um, as far as study participants, I approached certified coaches, so PCCs and MCCs, and my criteria was to look for uh, those that had a minimum of five years experience. I limited my study to North America only because that's what I had access to. Future studies could expand across, you know, um, a lot further than just North America. And um, I also wanted to see if I could get coaches that pro practiced coaching full time, which was really difficult because most executive coaches that I had access to tended to have a role such as organizational development and then did coaching as part of their role or learning and development. So here's just a really quick snapshot of who my study participants were. And so um, as far as the tool that I used, I chose to explore the participants' learning strategy preference using the ATLAS instrument. And ATLAS stands for assessing the learning strategies of adults. I'll tell you just a little bit about the genesis of ATLAS. Some of you have probably come across SKILLS, S-K-I-L-L-S. So ATLAS actually emerged after SKILLS did. And it arose out of Dr. Rita Collodi's research where she drew upon the research that had been conducted on SKILLS. And she used refined statistical analysis and determined that there were actually three distinct learning strategy preference groups. And so using cluster analysis, divided participants into three different groups with, um, and a discriminant analysis was conducted and used to determine one distinct characteristic, which as you can see on the slide is called discriminant function, which is what separates one group of people from the other. So simply put, um, if you take a group of adults and put them through um, this assessment tool, and we can talk about construct validity in a different conversation, they tend to always revert to one of the three distinct preference groups. So if you look at the ones that are in front of you, so navigators, for example, um, the discriminant function, what separates them from the others was identified as structure. So if you're looking at landing strategy preferences for navigators, you're looking at um, their strong preference being planning and organizing, and they're generally called navigators because their preference, um, they, they prefer to be informed of the big picture with all the detailed expectations and deadlines so they can plan and then they navigate their way to success. Um, if you look at the problem solvers, their discriminant function is critical thinking with a preference for generating alternatives, conditional acceptance, testing assumptions. And the problem solvers group was given this name because they also have a very high level of self-efficacy. In other words, they have a lot of confidence in their ability to figure it out as they go along. So just to circle back to coaching, if you're looking at, if you're coaching an executive and you notice that really what they want to do is to be able to figure things as they go along, there's a chance that they're problem solvers, that's their preference. If they seem to be the type that want everything completely well organized an agenda, dates, times, there's a chance that they have a navigator um, preference, learning preference. And of course, you have the third group, which is the engager group, which receives their name because of the strong preference for seeking out meaningful interactions. Not that anyone else doesn't, but that seems to be their strong preference in making a difference, whether it's in someone's individual life or in the world in general. So you'll find that engagers have this very strong preference. If you were, for example, coaching an executive who was an engager, they'd be focused on what difference am I making in my role or what difference is my team making? So there's a strong connection between the um, work that they're doing and what connections they can make between that work and actual reward enjoyment of life. So that's just a really quick overview of what the three different, of, of the um, assessment tool that I used. Um, quick overview of the study. 
Um, like I mentioned, I started off by identifying participants. They all had to be certified coaches. Some were PCCs, some were MCCs, um, minimum five years of experience. And so the second, the, the first thing that I did is I checked in to make sure that none of them knew what their preference was. So we went in with the coaches not knowing what their learning strategy preference was. And so we did the cell scoring tool, the Atlas tool, and they found out and self-identified what their preferences were. We did a, about an hour debrief in understanding what does that mean for you? What does being a navigator mean for you? What does being a navigator mean for your client who might be an engager and how might that conversation look like? And then once we were done with that, I let one month lapse in between. It's almost like a quasi experiment. And then after that, we did a post test to examine if anything at all had changed in regard to the way coaches related with their clients. Now that they had a new formed awareness of what their learning preference um, strategy preference was. And so just to browse through the findings really quickly, all 12 participants admitted that they had a lack of awareness on what their learning strategy preferences were. And after the facilitated workshop, they were able to self-identify with their learning preference group. They became aware of how their learning preference influenced how they facilitated conversation with clients. So to give you a quick example, if the coach was a navigator, they identified that when they spoke with their clients um, in an executive coaching session, they tended to you know, give them homework that involved dates and times and agendas and calendars. Whereas if they were problem solvers in, in having conversations with their clients, they found that they pretty much used almost like a mind map approach in trying to figure out what was going on and how they can get to a resolution. Um, whereas engagers found out that they, in conversation with their clients, they tended to look for meaning. Is this meaningful to you? Is it adding value? And how can, what can you do to make it add value sort of kind of a discussion? Um, so as we all know, in executive coaching, you have a list of competencies um, that um, make you are, I'm not good, I'm looking for a word, that make you a successful coach, if you can call it that. So I looked through the competencies provided by ICF and asked around and tried to see what other coaches thought the top competencies were and decided to go with questioning and listening as the two key competencies. Only, um, not only, but mainly due to the fact that um, the very nature of coaching and how conversations are facilitated is through inquiry and listening to formulate patterns that may involve the next inquiry and hopefully draw closer to trying to co-formulate a solution with the client. So um, looking at these two competencies, the question, I became aware of how my learning strategy influence, uh, influences how I facilitate conversations with my clients. Eight people say that they changed the way they listened. Three of them did not change. One was unsure. When it came to questioning, three of them changed the way they questioned their clients with this newly formed awareness. Eight of them did not, and one was unsure. Um, looking at change, so remember we're talking about now that you're cognitively aware of something new about yourself or how you approach your practice did you go back and actually make a change four people said no six of them yes initially but reverted to old ways and two of them were yes in other words they actually went back and changed the way they did their practice so mm -hmm. talking a little bit about the summary of key findings which i found really interesting um Ongoing commitment to learning is considered an essential business practice for coaches, right? Otherwise, or rather, however, there's been debate whether training, such as the cognitive awareness training I did, whether it actually impacts what professionals do in their day-to-day -day practice. So the study involved coaches learning a new construct, i.e. learning strategy preferences, and then further tested whether they would in turn modify or reinforce existing behavior. And like we said, we used the competencies of questioning and listening as the two key ones. Um, most of the findings showed that participants changed the way they listened to their clients, but not the way they constructed questions for their clients. And again, in looking a little bit deeper about this, um, because coaching tends to be heavily centered on the art of questioning, it's actually not rare to find a quote-unquote Bible of questions 
that coaches can ask their clients to facilitate conversations. So there's a chance that coaches who have been in the profession for a certain length of time, remember we had five years minimum, they've tried several different ways of constructing questions to navigate conversations. And in turn, what's happened is they've built cognitive maps that rely on certain proven questioning techniques as they interact with their clients and they experience moments of getting stuck. So they were able to, they have these questions that they know actually work because they have a cognitive map on what you do if A doesn't work, you go to B, right? When it came to listening though, one can argue that a coach would not be able to always tell what a client is going to say next and so might be a little bit more open to listening with an open mind because there's really no quote unquote cheat shit, if you may, when it comes to listening, which is possibly why the results came out the way they did. Um, a lot more people were quite open to changing the way they listened, but when it came to questioning, not so much. Um, as a researcher, my observation from this is that coaches seem to let go of their mental models, such as how to ask questions. And the ones who actually let go of that mental model seemed to be the same ones that were actually able to adjust their listening. It's almost as though the two went, went um, hand in hand, right? And so just to go over just a little bit about um, the so what part of it, discussions and implications. One of the other key points that jumps out when I'm reviewing the findings from my study is that attitudes can actually change over time but usually some sort of positive experience needs to occur for our ingrained attitudes to change. So one of the coaches in the study specifically indicated that he changed the way he used the competencies of listening and questioning. And because he found out that he was successful, he went ahead and created a cheat sheet with different sets of questions based on learning preference type. So in the past where he would ask everyone the same question, he went back and he thought, hmm, if I figure out that my client is probably a navigator, what do my questions need to look like in order to speak to him, quote unquote? Um, now, there's a chance that professionals that have been practicing for several years and established a proven system that works may actually not be ready to change all that after just one hour session, right? And so that could have possibly been one of the reasons why there was hesitance. Now, another point that we should not ignore is the impact of prior knowledge. So we're looking at point three, the impact of prior knowledge and the potential to change because of new awareness that you get through training. If you look back at the study participants that I shared, there were seasoned professional coaches that ranged in practice from six to 30 years experience. So you can almost assume that each participant, regardless of learning strategy type, had a well-designed cognitive map they followed, they carried on their practice in a very deliberate way. And usually, in order to experience and reinforce change, there's a motivational element that needs to happen that stems a lot further than just a training session. And so controlling variables such as prior knowledge and motivation still remains a challenge for researchers in the field, but definitely something that needs to be done so that we are able to help different groups understand what it means to get new knowledge and how that can be used to impact practice. And one other thing that I should mention is one of the things that also, before we get into the questions, one of, one of the other things that also may have impacted the study is the, just the word change itself. If you ask somebody, did you change your practice? It has a different impact on, on people really. So there's a chance that maybe if I was to do the study um, with a bigger group, I would avoid the use of the word change. And I'm going to stop that share. Great, well, thank you so much, Dr. Makodin, for sharing your study. Um, there's a number of questions that came up for me as I uh, listen to you explain what you learned. And one, one is this idea of, of uh, metacognition, being more aware of one's own style, but yet um, having some resistance to change your pattern, right? So I, I'm curious about what do you think does help um, practitioners, coaches to, to change the, the tried and true and experiment? Because it sounds right. like there was some initial experimentation and then they went back to their previous uh, tried and true methods. I'm just curious if any of them commented on 
why that was the case. <laughs> right. Um, if I can request Dan to put himself on uh, mute, please. Only because I can hear static. So um, the whole concept of metacognition, which if I can, re I mean, it's, it's a lot broader than that, but if I can just reduce it to layman's language, it's, it's pretty much um, understanding and knowing how you think, understanding your thought process, understanding your learning process. So when I talk about um, approaching coaching as a learning activity, we're looking at the core um, result that you're looking from in coaching is to learn whether it's learn about yourself. When, when, when a coach and a coachee embark on that relationship, each of them learns, whether it's about each other or about themselves or about something else. So when you throw in metacognition, you're looking at, I need to, you know, it's almost like reflective practice. When I sit back and I look at what I've learned and I understand how do I learn? Is it from storytelling? So, for example, if you are a problem solver, and I feel like I'm a little around the, the way with this, but if you were a problem solver and critical thinking was your biggest thing, you would probably prefer storytelling because you're able to ask why, as opposed to a manual, which you would prefer if you were a navigator type, because everything is sequential, it's orderly, it's you know something you can go back to again and again. So looking at things like those, metacognition, metamotivation, and how do I learn as a person? Because the person that you're coaching is also learning, and there's a chance that they learn differently from you. So how does that conversation go? Yeah, so it's like finding that match between the coach's style and the uh, client's needs. Yes. Hmm. Okay. So any, any recommendations on how to better do that? Because I think that's an important factor when it comes to being a successful coach. Are, are we meeting the needs of our clients or, or just going with what we, what we like or what we prefer as, a, as an approach? Um, right. Any thoughts on how to bring that more to the surface? So one thing that I do is I, I mean, the Atlas tool, the self-assessment tool takes two minutes. Mm. So it's not much. When I'm doing my designed alliance or contracting, as some may call it, find out how they like to learn and find out what some people do the MBTI with them. So that's one of the ways where you can actually, that's one of the ways you can actually find out what the preference of the person is. I'll give you an example in organizations, for example. Say I have a boss who happens to be a navigator that really enjoys things that are orderly, sequential, big picture, but I happen to be a problem solver who prefers mind maps, who prefers self-efficacy, figuring things as we go along. There's a chance that if we're not on the same page about how we prefer to learn, we might have a little bit of a conflict because I'd be submitting my work to him that kind of looks like a mind map and he'll be going, you need to get more organized. What is this? <laughs> so this, in the same exact fashion with your clients too, when you give them, when you're having a coaching conversation with them and you're kind of all over the place, but they're a navigator, they might go slow down. You're confusing me or something or vice versa. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you can take the time to find out what their preferences are learning or otherwise, it makes for a lot more easier conversation. Great, excellent. We, we also have a question from the audience. Hank, do you want to come online and ask your question? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? We I can hear you. And you can turn on your video if you want temporarily. I can't. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, there it is. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, having unfortunately been very long in the field of coaching and probably, you know, stuck to a lot of my own ways of approaching that kind of re client relationship. What I'm curious about, I'm very, I'm very curious about this, and it comes to mind for me that as I think about just some of my current clients and each of them having their own distinct ways of working through becoming self-aware and then taking on some of the field work that they need to take on to go test some new ways of being more effective as leaders. I mean, this, I'm really curious about this because I think this is very important. I'm just curious the degree, to, if you have any sense of how much leverage or impact this could have by spending time 
bringing it more into my practice because it could be that some of the reasons some of your um, uh, participants probably didn't take it on is they may not have believed that learning more about this would make that much difference, that they were probably doing just fine with their clients. But do you have a sense of if I spent some time understanding this and incorporating this, how much impact it may have for me? It's interesting that you actually say that because that was one of my recommendations to use deliberate practice as a form of training where you actually, you're very deliberate in trying to learn whether it's cognitive awareness or whatever it is. And deliver, deliberate practice could look anything from coaching and mentoring to the reason why I specifically say deliberate practice is because you can, you can actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Customize it to the knowledge level. Because one of the other things that happens is when you sit in a group of people between six and 30 years experience, the learning is not the same, even though the content is the same that you're giving them. So how can you use deliberate practice into customizing and making sure that that person that has been doing this for 20 years, you recognize that they have a cognitive map that they will revert to, whether you like it or not, it's you know human behavior. They've tried it, they know it works, they know it's true. So why change everything I've been doing just because I learned something new? So how do you make it deliberate enough for them to actually want to try it out? And my findings was that one training session doesn't do it. It's kind of the very definition of why we do coaching over time is yes. to uh, really give people a chance to experiment, uh, you know, reflect, learn, try again. You know, the, the whole um, conscious competence model is in, implied by this where you're always doing more and more uh, mentoring, coaching, trying, experimentation, reflection. Um, so it was, it was interesting that that was confirmed by your study as well. That is actually a perfect example of looking at it, Terry, because in the end, we are good at doing that with clients, but as coaches, what do we do for ourselves to make sure that we are continually learning and that the learning actually lands and it sticks? Yeah, that's a really good point. So we also have a, another question from the audience, from mm -hmm. Lisa. Lisa, do you wanna ask your question or would you uh, rather me read it? Sure. Just had a quick question on, um, you mentioned in your study, and, and thanks for your time today, um, that you we wanted to use words other than change, potentially impacting responses. What other synonyms, or instead of the word change, do you think might be effective or helpful with your, your questioning of the coaches? That is a really good question, <laughs> because I struggled with it myself, and I kept saying, what else would I say other than, did you change your practice? Hmm. I'm still thinking about that one, honestly. I know, I know for a fact that the word change put people off. And right away they thought, why would I change my practice because I took an hour class? I've been doing this for 20 years. So I, I am still looking for this. If anyone has a suggestion, I'm still looking for that synonym that I can use for the next study that doesn't say change. Mm. Yeah. Maybe learn, I don't know. Evolve. Evolve, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Any, any other follow-up questions, Lisa? No, that answered my question. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, Joe, Not by much, oh. but we could take a look and maybe ask around and see what would come up as, a, you know, in, in lieu of the word change. Great. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, a very interesting. Uh, the presentation and um, the results and the discussion. And my question stroke uh, reflection is um, on that question of uh, accepting to change. Uh, and sometimes as a coach, uh, what I do when I use instruments uh, for self-awareness or metacognition is to propose a stretching in both boundaries. So knowing that you are as you are, or you act as you act, uh, what can you do uh, to leverage that knowing? So it's offering a possibility to, to change for better or to, to leverage from. But also knowing that your preference is this, how can you stretch yourself on the other hand to offer something better 
in that case to your followers or to your team partners. Uh, so maybe that's a, a possibility to to really facilitate the change uh, in that case because it's really offering the best of both worlds. Absolutely, absolutely. And if I had another chance to do the uh, to continue on with the study, I would get the coaches back in the room and actually ask them what stopped them from making a permanent change because as you notice some of them changed and then reverted back to the old way so just like you're saying there is a chance that if i sat down with the problem solvers and said hey let's talk about some of the tools that you could use to help you tap into your engager side or tap into your navigator side is it um planning and organizing and what does that look like so yeah, that's a good point. That is something that could potentially be used in the future. Thank you. Yeah. I'm also curious about this uh, Atlas tool. Yeah. Um, uh, I've, I'm not used that tool, but I've used similar tools like the Berkman, which uh, looks at um, your usual behavior and then also your needs, how you want others to, to treat you. And it, it's not exactly learning styles, but it's it's more of a, uh, behavioral, um, you know, st leadership style, communication style, et cetera. Um, one of the things I, I use that tool a lot is at the beginning of engagements to get to know the client really quickly and then also for them to get to know themselves. But um, I, I find that the tool is most effective when I come back to it again and again with real life situations that they're dealing with. Uh, to provide insights into specific situations that that they're bringing up uh, over a long longer period of time so so I'm just wondering about that since it seems like you use the Atlas tool uh, have you found it helpful uh, for longer term engagements uh, as you've worked with clients over time absolutely absolutely um, just in something as simple as taking a look to see when you're doing executive coaching. I, I also do organizational development, but if we can talk about a, a executive coaching, when you're coaching a client and you find that you're stuck. I have used the Atlas tool to try and figure out what the, what is making you stuck because there's a communication aspect in there. Mm. So sometimes listening and questioning, um, how do I do a, explain that so i'll give you an example i am an engager i am one of those people who want to see connection and meaning in pretty much anything that i do not to say that others don't but that is my distinct preference right so if somebody if i was getting coached by a navigator who talked about agendas and talked about business and talked about ways to do things and everything was sequential and big picture and without showing me meaning, we would have a conversation where I would be a little stuck. Mm. If we used Atlas and we sat down and said, wait a minute, um, as an engager, I need to see where the connections are. And once I see the connections, then I'm able to turn around and look at how you're navigating through the series. But without me seeing the connection, I have a cognitive block. Right, right. Because it's not making sense to me. It's just a list of documents and things to do. And it's kind of... In, in meetings, you'll see it a lot where people will go, can't we just get to the meeting already, which is probably navigators, or you'll have engagers go, wait, but what does this mean? And how, did, how you know, how is it going to impact John? And so th there's a million and one different things going on that, yeah. Right. So, so as you've been describing this, it's, it seems that there may be value in actually exploring all three in an coaching engagement to see things from multiple perspectives, uh, to ask questions that might um, challenge the client to be a little more flexible, but, but also challenge the coach to, to you know, not use the tried and true kind of in a rut kind of approach. Uh, but, but I'm curious about that. Have, have you experimented with actually hitting all, all of those types of questions from multiple perspectives? And, and if that works or doesn't work, Yes, I have actually. So one of the things that I do, I don't tell them here, let's do Atlas. Right. I'll actually ask them certain questions 
and I can usually be able to tell whether they're a navigator, a problem solver, or an engager. As we're having our coaching conversation and maybe they have conflict going on with somebody else at work, as they're explaining to me about the person they're having conflict with, sometimes I'm able to actually tell that it's a learning preference kind of clash. Mm. Because this person is all over the place. They don't really put, the, they don't file things in an orderly way. You can't find any information you're looking for in the drive, but they're probably a problem solver. <laughs> talking, you know, talking to an engager who wants everything sequential in, you know, in a certain way. It's neither wrong nor right for both of them. It's just a preference, right? And it doesn't mean that one can't do the others right. work. They both can do each other's. It's just what is your strong preference given a choice what would you revert to uh, yeah. so i have used it in trying to figure out what you know when you have a conversation around maybe an executive that's having conflict with another executive it may be an agenda um con clash in vision or agenda sometimes it's something as simple as clash in preference mm -hmm. yeah so so we're kind of talking a lot about um the awareness of the client so the client comes into greater self-awareness and then can use that um, as a, a almost like a troubleshooting tool to look at different dynamics that might be going in their workplace. Um, I'm also curious about the coach's use of self. So in, in evidence-based coaching, that's one of our four pillars is our, our own use of self and how we show up and our personal self-management. And it does seem like this tool would be helpful for that if, if we were fully aware of it, uh, you know, and bringing that in to the conversation to say, okay, how am I behaving right now? Am I giving this client what they need? Or am I looking at things from multiple perspectives, um, not just my own preference? Uh, so um, have you seen that help you personally as you, you know, engage in, your own use of self with clients by uh, having this greater self-awareness. Absolutely. Because one thing that we either realize or not is when you're coaching someone, the coach's full self shows up, whether we are conscious of it or not. Right. And so one of the things that we need to do is continually be more conscious about ourselves so that we are able to change perspectives by looking, you know, introspecting and going, Okay, so that's how I would do it, but it doesn't mean that it's what works for this person. So me giving, um, me guiding them and facilitating a conversation, I need to catch myself when I'm trying to facilitate it in a way that I would like it facilitated to me versus what is actually serving for them. Yeah, yeah. So, so as a, I think you mentioned you're the, the person who likes to connect and find meaning. Yeah. Um, how do you think that may bias your own coaching style and how do you avoid that um, becoming a problem? If it is, I, I don't, I'm not sure. If oh, it, it can be. It absolutely can be. One of the things that I've come across myself um, because I'm one of those people that try to find the connection and meaning before I jump onto something tangible, it can be looked at as time wasting mm -hmm. because especially if you have, and I'm throwing this out there, it could be a navigator, it could be a problem solver, it could be another engager. But because I'm busy trying to find meaning and connection, the other person can get impatient. Right. So I need to understand when that self, that side of me is showing up so I can pull out my problem solver tool toolbox and say, okay, I probably need to let this and try and figure it as I go along. The meaning will come out. So I have reverted to the other toolboxes to try and pull things out because as an engager, I could be seen as time wasting. I could be seen as overly sensitive. Mm. So things that I need to be aware as I communicate with my clients. So what advice do you have for coaches that may be listening to develop those other toolboxes? Because it may not be your favorite thing to do, right? To be a navigator, especially if you kind of an aversion to structure which, you know, I think some coaches might. Um, so what, what advice do you have for them to build up that uh, skill, if you will, so that they can be more flexible and meet the needs of their clients where they're at, as opposed to just being a kind of one, uh, right. one note kind of coach? 
I don't, I keep reverting right back to deliberate practice. It has to be completely deliberate on your part where you say, well, I know that my client, John, likes structure. I don't like structure. But when I talk to John, I'm going to make sure that I do. I plan the conversation. I organize this and that and that, even though I'd like to go on it, you know, just let's start from this point and get to wherever we'll get to at the end of the day. So I could be very deliberate in how I approach my conversations with John mm -hmm. and continue practicing it until I'm able to. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So it's that being flexible to put on different hats depending on the situation. And certainly, you know, this is a, a really important um, part of evidence-based coaching is, you know, being able to use different theories, different models, different tools, depending on what the, the client needs. Um, I'm also wondering, um, we, we have one more, um, I'm going to go back to the, the audience for a second. So Chris, would you like to come online to ask your question? Hi. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, thank you very much, Millie. This is a fascinating conversation. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I was just wondering if, if any of the three preferences um, are, are dominant at the executive level or even uh, within functional positions. Does a CEO tend to be like this or does a CFO tend to be like that? Uh, or do you just assume an even split? And I ask the question because I have a very um, homogeneous group. I, I work in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. with, with Arabs. Uh, and so there's just kind of a tendency to be a certain yeah. way. And I assume that way, um, you know, bef before, you know, when I begin to work with people and then I tend to branch out. But I'd be very curious about your, your, your knowledge here. Right. See, that's the interesting part because um, there's also land behavior. So for example, if today I was told that I had to go and be a CEO in a financial institution, I would learn how to be a navigator because maybe things would need to be in a certain, you know, in a certain way. So basically what I'm saying is some, there is, there is your preference that you're born with. And there is also the other side of it, which is a learned behavior based on the role that you're performing. And sometimes when you're coaching an executive that is out of their preference zone, so to speak, they're a certain, person because the job requires it to be, you can still be able to see the clash between their actual preference and what they're trying to do. And so that can actually end up being a very rich conversation around how do you gain tools in your toolbox to be that preference that you're not, but your job requires you to be. Make sense? Mm. Sometimes I call that using the, the left hand or the non-preferred hand, <laughs> right? Exactly. The metaphor of handedness is often help, helpful and with preferences, where uh, even though it may not be your preference, you can, with a lot of practice and effort, learn how to do it. But you may never love that, that job, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. where, where it might be a, a kind of a secondary role that you end up playing. Or maybe you learn to love it and become ambidextrous. That's always a possibility too. Yeah. Exactly. You could spend your time, your coaching conversations, perfecting the toolbox that enables you to be a problem solver, for example. Yeah, Lisa just made a comment. It can also be called code switching, right? Where you're, Oh, good. Yeah, it's an interesting um, uh, metaphor for that as well. So any advice that you have... Uh, Dr. Mokadine, for someone who may be interested in learning more about this tool or this method or, or metacognition in general uh, in the coaching field. Yes, absolutely. Um, feel free to contact me, I guess. <laughs> Great. I'm quite happy. I've, I've written a couple of papers on that as well, which I'm more than happy to share. And um, yeah, reach out and contact me and I can point you to resources that you can take a look at. I can point you to the Atlas tool details. Excellent. And, yeah. uh, and of course, we can ha continue this dialogue on the online Basecamp community and the community of practice as well. Absolutely. Great. Any last questions from the audience uh, that anyone would like to ask before we wrap up tonight?
Okay, well, thank you, Dr. McElgene. I'm gonna uh, give a few announcements here before we wrap up. Okay. But thank you for joining us and sharing your research and, and enabling us to have this dialogue and we look forward to your continued engagement uh, online as well. So folks can continue to ask questions. Um, also, if, if you're open to posting your slides on okay. the community of practice, that may be helpful as well for those who, who weren't able to attend tonight. So I do have a couple of announcements uh, for those who may be new to fielding or have not been uh, previously engaged in our community of practice. Um, what this program tonight is, is part of a larger system where you can uh, twice a month hear from scholars and practitioners on their latest research as well as uh, what they're doing out in the world of, of coaching. Uh, and we encourage you to, to join us. Uh, we have what's called uh, this Community of Practice Basecamp site, and you can uh, become a member for free uh, by going to ccop.fielding.edu. That's the Coaching Community of Practice, ccop.fielding.edu, and fill out a short questionnaire and we can add you. Um, we also have previous recordings posted on that site, so you can have access to all of our previous webinars. Um, we also have opportunities for you to gain continuing coach education hours through our annual conference. We just finished our annual conference in May in Santa Barbara. So the next one will be in 2020. So uh, by joining the community of practice, you can stay tuned there. We also have writing and publishing opportunities. Uh, we publish a um, what's called a, a monograph uh, through the Fielding Graduate University Press uh, on coaching. And uh, we will be having another call for proposals next year. Our current deadline has passed. We also encourage people to write for our EBC blog. So if you go to coach.fielding.edu, you can see our blog. I'm gonna go ahead and just quickly share that on the screen so people can see it. Uh, this um, is a, a powerful way to stay in touch with all things fielding and uh, also thought leadership in this space. Um, we also, in case you aren't aware, uh, offer uh, graduate level degrees um, in concentration and coaching, as well as certificate programs. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more, you can go to coach.fielding.edu and learn about all of our programs to continue your growth as a coaching professional. So thank you all for joining. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mokodin, for joining. And we look forward to staying in touch. It was my pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Bye for now, everyone.